Good afternoon. I'm Brian Leverage. And I'm Jeffrey Holst. And this is episode five of the Old Fashioned Real Estate Show. We're glad to be back here with you guys today and excited to share more educational information with you. Uh, remember, before we get started, please go to our YouTube page, uh, Old Fashioned Real Estate Show, and uh, subscribe to that. You can see other episodes there as well. Uh, today, we've got an interesting topic. Uh, Jeff's going to do something he's really good at, that's talk. And he's going to talk about the four sources of real estate returns. So without further ado, Jeff, have at it. Wait, I'm supposed to talk today? <laughs> I wasn't aware of that. Um, I'm just going to have to wing it with my notes here that I'm not supposed to have. Um, anyway, so uh, the four sources of real estate returns. So really what we're looking at here is what are the different ways that you can make money from investing in real estate? And some of them are really obvious, right? I mean, some of them are like, you know, collecting rent. So, I um, mean, that falls under the first category, which is cash flows from operations. So cash flows from operations are going to be um, basically, basically like, you know, any kind of income that you receive. And that could be rents. It could be from... Uh, you know, parking fees, it could be from uh, storage fees, it could be any, anything, laundry, facility fees, things like that. Um, and then it's going to be that um, less all of your operating expenses. So we had talked about this in a previous episode, but a quick refresher, um, net operating income is, is really important when you're looking at um, real estate and net operating income is really just your income from all sources, less your after expenses. Exactly. So one thing to think about with, um, you know, when you're looking at cash flows from operations is, and with any of the sources of returns in real estate, is that you want to be constantly thinking about how to increase um, your return. And one of the things you can do um, to increase your return, of course, is to lower your expenses. Um, but another thing you can do is uh, to raise your rents. And some of that's going to happen naturally over time. Um, we all know that rents uh, go up over time. And that expenses are also going to go up over time. But in an ideal situation, your rents will be higher than your expenses uh, to start with. And so if your rents go up 3% in one year and your expenses go up in 3% in one year, that gap between the income and expenses will actually grow. Uh, if you think about it this way, say you have a property that makes $10,000 a, a year in operating you know, um, income. And at that $10,000 goes up 3%, right? And then you have maybe say $5,000 a year in operating expenses. And, and that 5,000 also goes up 3%. The difference is gonna be 10,000 will go up to $10,300 per year, and the 5,000 would go up to $5,150 per year. So that difference is $150 in extra income that you get, and that's a- And that compounds over time, which is pretty powerful. Exactly, exactly. So that's the, you know, that's the first source of returns is the operating income and cash flows from operation. The second source of returns from real estate would be the various tax advantages that you get. Um, and I, I think this is really important to understand because one of the things that people don't always realize is that not all income is treated exactly the same. So um, with real estate, you have several advantages when it comes to um taxes. For example, you have a thing called depreciation. And, and Brian, I think you're familiar with depreciation. Maybe you'd like to speak about that. Absolutely. It, it's a, a, a unique topic in that this year, that, so the tax code was recently changed specifically for real estate investors. And so depreciation, the Cliff's Notes version is, is buildings age over time just like people do and everything else does. And so the government allows you to take a deduction. And on a simple line on a residential property, which is a house or an apartment building or a duplex, that is 27 and a half years. So you back out the value of the land, you divide the remainder, which is typically 80% of that purchase price. And then you divide that by 27 and a half. And that's the amount the government will let you take in depreciation each year. Now there is, and the more recent advantage is there's what's called cost segregation. You can get a study done on that and by a third party and your CPA has to work with it. But essentially, things depreciate in different time frames. For instance, a roof lasts longer than a heating and air unit typically. And so what the government will now do is all those 
items that would depreciate on a short schedule are now allowed to be deducted in a single year, which provides a tremendous tax savings. Of course, this is not tax advice. Do you talk to your own CPA, attorney, et cetera, to see what works and best I, for you? I think it also matters what jurisdiction you're in. So like if you're not in the United States, the rules are gonna be different. But the main point is you're gonna be able to take a non-cash expense, a depreciation allowance, um, and it doesn't matter if the building goes up or down in value during that time, you're still able to write off some portion of that um, asset price in, in, in the current year. And, and if it's doing a cost seg like Brian was talking about, um, it can be fairly significant. It might be 10, 15, 20% of the purchase price that you could write off uh, in a single year. And that, of course, is beneficial yeah. if you're... The net effect of which is that it actually, you could create a paper loss, not a real loss, and you get to deduct that paper loss against your income and completely shelter any tax liability you may have. Right. And when we talk about um, sheltering tax liability, um, and this, this goes with a um, source of real estate returns we haven't covered yet, but when when you have appreciation and value, you're not necessarily paying for that increase in value right away. So if you have a, a piece of property that you bought for 100,000 and the value goes up to 200,000 uh, and the rents have gone up during that time, um, you're not paying any tax on that gain uh, because you haven't actually realized that gain yet. So it's like a deferred capital gains. And that's another one of the sources of returns that you really need to be thinking about when you're planning out or modeling your real estate investment. Um, and then another thing to think about is that when you sell it and you would normally be paying those gains, um, there are possibilities, at, at least in the United States, but in, in most jurisdictions, to do a thing called a tax deferred exchange. And it's, it's part of the 1031 exchange in the United States. And basically what a 1031 is, is it's an option where you can sell one piece of property and replace it with another piece of property. You know, you have to follow certain guidelines. Um, you have to have a third party intermediary handle the funds. You have to close in a certain amount of time. Um, and that's kind of beyond the scope of this video. But if you follow those rules and you want your CPA obviously involved in that, um, then you would not have to pay those capital gains. You'd essentially roll forward those gains to your next investment. Um, and you can do that forever. You can continue to defer gains um, and, and then also 1031 those gains onto new investments uh, right up until the time you die and, and never actually pay those. So that's a pretty significant tax advantage. For it people. is. It is. Of course, there's several other ways that you can increase your returns. Why don't you tell us about the next one? Of sure. Those? So um, I alluded to this a moment ago, but appreciation, which is, um, you know, when the asset that you bought goes up in value, this is a gain that, um, you know, that you can't always predict, but um, you can usually assume that over time, real estate values will go up. Um, that's, that's a pretty typical assumption. And there's a couple of different ways this happens. So you have um, sort of a natural appreciation. It might be two, three, four percent a year. Um, if you buy a house, a single family house for $100,000 today, maybe five years from now, that house is worth $120,000. That difference, the $20,000 is the result of a natural appreciation in prices over time. Um, and that's definitely something that you want to think about when you're modeling your returns, uh, because you could be looking at uh, a property that maybe only makes a few hundred dollars a month and think, well, wow, it's a lot of money to invest to make a couple hundred dollars a month. But if you get that extra $20,000 in the mix, it could be very significant. Um, there's another type of appreciation uh, called a forced appreciation. And this is um, not for single family residential. Typically it's for multifamily or commercial properties that are valued a little bit differently than, uh, than, than single families. They're valued based on an income approach. And what you can do with, a, with an income approach property is if you increase the income or, depre or decrease the expenses, you're actually increasing that net operating income that we talked about earlier. Um, and by doing that, um, you can essentially force the value of the property up because an investor will look at that property and they'll say, you know, it makes $100,000 a year and I typically want to get an 8% return on my money. So I'm willing to pay. It's an inverse relationship. So the math's a little funky, but basically you take the net operating income, you divide it by the expected return, and you come up with a number. And I think in that case, it would be like 125000 
Um, I didn't bring a calculator, so I'm pretty sure that's right, but it's somewhere around there. Uh, anyway, so if you increase that net operating income, though, um, say from 100 to $200,000 a year, that same investor who wants an 8% return would be willing to pay how much, Brian? I wasn't paying that close attention. Just say double. Double. Double, that's right. <laughs> so, yeah, so I mean, if you have uh, double the income, you have double the value. So uh, that's forced appreciation, and that's something that um, it's a bit of an advanced strategy, but it's something that can be really, really beneficial and can really supercharge your total return on your investment. Yeah, yeah. No, that's you great information. You need to drink more, I think, is your problem. <laughs> so the last way that we can uh, generate real estate returns is by amortization schedules. And so that is really something that's almost systematic. You don't really need to do anything on rental property other than collect your income, make sure your expenses are low enough that whatever net operating income is left covers your debt service. And what that will do is just by paying your mortgage or loan every single month, the equity buildup in the property will increase over time. So for instance, most commercial loans are done on a 20 year amortization schedule, at least on properties that tend to be you know, under 2 million bucks. And what that means is that out of where the present interest rate environment is during a five-year hold period, you'll pay off about 18% of the principal balance of that loan. So again, if you've got a million dollar loan, five years, you've paid off about $180,000. So if you sell, you only owe 820 and you get that money right. back at, at sale. Yeah, and then in fact, if you were to hold it for the entire 20 year amortization period, then you would have zero dollars. I mean, I think most people are gonna be familiar with this from the fixed rate 30 year mortgage that most people buy their personal residence with. And um, uh, just an interesting side note on amortization, um, the root of amortization, I don't know if you know this, Brian, is um, the. Um, is mortis. It's, a, it's death. Latin. It's death. And what, what it really means is it's a, a contract that expires on its own. It, it kills itself off. So if you just wait out the time period, um, you, you gain all of that value. So it's actually something that, of course, if you're not leveraging your property, you're not going to have any gains from amortization because you don't have any mortgage or note to pay off. Um, but if you do have a loan on it, and, and this is one of the primary reasons why leveraging your property makes really good sense. Uh, there are other reasons as well. There are some tax advantages and some um, cash flow advantages, but I mean, definitely can supercharge your returns. Um, and you can access that without even selling the property. Most people don't think about that, but you could be five years out and have paid $180,000 off. You could go to the bank and get a new loan and put that $180,000 back in your pocket uh, and tax-free if it's a loan because it's not a capital gain if you're just borrowing additional money. There are some rules generally, but you could also take that and go and buy another similar asset because typically you only have to come up with 20% down on a million dollar asset, so you're pretty close right there. And then that has the compound effect. Of course, and then you can- Doing more over time, so if you go from one property to two, keeping the, mo the mortgages exactly the same on each one, after that same five year hold time, you'll actually have three hundred and sixty thousand. Yeah, yeah, and I mean it's a it's yeah. maybe a six year hold or something to get a full sure. replacement. But but the point would be that you could actually double the number of properties you have every six years without adding any more money of your own. And that's a pretty powerful force. Yeah, and then of course if you do the forced appreciation, you can do it even faster. Um, and so it can be a really great thing. And you really need to think about all four of these sources of returns when you're making an investment decision because. Um, each one of them has a very important part to play in your overall income situation. Well, I think that about covers everything I for today. I believe it does. We appreciate your time. Cheers. Cheers.